Greetings. Well, the rain stopped over here, but what's really beautiful about living in Catalina Island, because we really are a desert island, is it doesn't look like one right now, right? It's green. I know people from like back east, they're like, they live and it's always green and they always have rain and always have clouds. But when you live out in West Southern California, sometimes you don't see clouds for days. Well, let me assure you, we've had our full of clouds and we have a ton of rain. And the most beautiful thing of all is to hear the running water. Everywhere we go, the water is just running. And there's research that says the health comes from being around running water. Oh. And I feel like it is so true because our blood's supposed to be moving, right? There's certain things that need to be moving, but one thing is for sure, we are not meant to shake. We're not to shake a baby's head. Whenever you get tremors or whenever as we get older and we shake, I think it refers to it in Ecclesiastes when the silver cord mm. gets broken and that mm. means your spinal cord. Mm. Um, that's what's so beautiful about the Lord and his kingdom and his foundations that um, the shaking is so different. We don't crumble down when we're on his foundation. You're That's like, right. wow, Santa, that was a quick turnaround. <laughs> but um, I just, I have a friend that struggles with her hands shaking. And that's, that's hard because when your hands shake, the more you want to grab something, the more it shakes, right? So, but the beautiful thing about God's kingdom is the more you stand on it, the surer it is. The more you step out in faith with the things that you believe and part of God's kingdom that is mm -hmm. unshakable, you are sturdy in the storm. You are sturdy in the fire. When things all around you are shaking, things and people you believed in let you down, and you're like, what? I, I really trusted them, or I thought. I mean, think about the people that have been investing in these banks that are closing. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about assuming that you're always going to be able to get your money when you, right? It's shakable. Everything that's going to shake is going to shake. Mm -hmm. But the kingdom of God, unshakable. So that's we're going to talk about the five reasons why the kingdom of God is unshakable. What's the first reason? So, so the first three, the first thing is you need to look at the strength of the king. Right? Oh, yeah. So uh, any any kingdom over its history, uh, the strength of it was based on the strength of the king. Yes. Um, and so, you know, whenever we, today, if we think of the word king, we, we might think of a couple of things. One of them is maybe some distant tyrant. Someone that's controlling King Charles everything. in England. Well, yeah, a lot of he's not tired. But he actually would fit the second one uh, of a, uh, a, a figurehead. You know, no English? longer, no longer, uh, no longer in basically con control, but they hold an office that has some symbolic uh, importance to it. But they no longer are, they no longer have the real power. But when we speak of Jesus Christ as our King, uh, we're not referring to a tyrant. We're not referring to a figurehead, um, not even a benevolent king no. who rules for a season. No. But we're speaking of a perfect and righteous and loving king, one who is absolutely sovereign in his authority and eternal in his reign. And so that is why our kingdom, the kingdom that we live in under the kingdom of God, is not shaken because it's eternal and it's under his authority. You know, if you look at the Old and New Testament, uh, it, it always pointed to Jesus, the Messiah, as being a king, right? David the psalmist, he wrote something that was very cool, very right? Psalm mm -hmm. 93. I love it. The Lord is king, he is clothed with majesty and strength. The earth is set firmly in place and cannot be moved. Your throne, O oh God, has been firm from the beginning and you existed before time began. I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then later on, the angel Gabriel when he announced to Mary that she would give birth to Jesus, she said this in, uh, oh, he said this in Luke 1. He says, he will be great mm -hmm. and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will, there be, will no be no end. end right? Yeah, that's and awesome. so that's the kingdom that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, this passage speaks that's to Jesus. That's what we're talking that's about. That's what we're talking about. Because uh, he was appointed to the throne by God, the Father, to reign over an eternal kingdom. And so later on, you'll see at the end of the of the scriptures in the King, book of Revelation. King, Lord of Lords, glory, hallelujah. That's another one. Elsewhere, Jesus referred as to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's, That's in right. Revelation 19, 16. Even this term, Lord, used so often of Jesus, speaks of his supreme power and authority. That's right. That's right. In Ephesians 1.20, it says, it tells us that Jesus is now, right now at this moment, 
seated at God's right hand mm -hmm. in the heavenly places. He's far above all mm -hmm. rule and authority mm -hmm. and power mm -hmm. and dominion. Mm -hmm. And he's above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So he is, is in the highest place at this very moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, over all creation, over everything that exists, he is over all that. Mm -hmm. And so, so the first thing is we need to recognize that the king, you know, the, the king that we follow, he has absolute power, right? The second thing is his truth. His truth is absolute, right? You know, the world's changing, right? It doesn't really have an anchor of truth. It's like, ah, truth is relative, right? The buzzwords, mm -hmm. it's equivocal. Quibical says that all ideas and their expressions are equally valid, right? right. And relativism is... Well, it's, it's, a, it's a position, a philosophical position that says that all points of view are right. equally valid and that all truth is relative to the individual. In other words, whatever works for you, right? And so it's kind of like the scripture in the Old Testament yes, says that everyone did what was right in their own yes, eyes, right? Yes, yes. And, so, and yet the ancient Greeks, as they were wrestling through this philosophy, because it's been around for a long time, um, they knew that there was something totally and completely right. Something that they knew that had to be a base, something that had to be an anchor. And that absolute truth was at the heart of the universe. And they call it the logos. Oh, right, yeah. And it was the expression of the core reality that holds everything together. It is the structural center, the central nervous right. system, the brain of the cosmos. And so they looked at this logos as like, there's something that everything stands on, something that is absolutely absolute, that's not going to change, because everything else seems crazy, but there's got to be something that is stands on its own. Absolute. Doesn't on its it own. say Jesus holds all things together? That's right. And they know there's a force that keeps even the atom together. That's right. It's a force of energy. I love it. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. That's right. That is one of the most amazing, the logos, right? The mm -hmm. Greek word logos. That's right. a beautiful verse. And That's it right. brings me so, so much comfort. You know, um, the philosophers, when they were wrestling with this, um, Heraclitus, I think his name is, the word, as he says this, the world was in flux. The impersonal divine and unchanging logos held it together and guided the changing process. So he was basically saying... There's this God that we can't connect with or this divine power that, uh, that's the unchanging logos. It's the one that holds everything together. You couldn't find it, but he says there's got to be something, right? right? Plato even said this. He spoke of the imper impersonal and unchanging logos that kept the planets on course and determined mm -hmm. the seasons, right? Mm -hmm. so the Stoics at that time, uh, they, uh, they said that the, um, that the world reason or the manager was semi-personal there was something some a force a power a right. truth that was that was going to keep everything together and then Philo, he personified it he's he called the logos as the high priest that set the soul of man before god or the bridge between man and god or the tiller by which the pilot of the universe steers all things so F philo was actually coming to a place of understanding there's got to be a person it's got to be someone, mm -hmm. right, right, that is beyond this. Because how did how did they even create it? How did they even think it up, right? And so, so John uh, in the Gospels is the only writer to specifically refer to Jesus as the Word or as the Logos. And first, notice that John clearly identifies the, the Word by putting on flesh and blood on the Logos, right? In John one fourteen. Says, and the word became flesh. Mm. The logos became flesh. Mm -hmm. the, the absolute truth and the thing that everything holds everything together actually became flesh. And then he says, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of, a, of the only begotten of from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right. Mm -hmm. So he recognized, you know, this is this is something that the people have been wrestling with. And he says, oh, I know who the Logos is. Mm -hmm. The Logos is Jesus. Absolutely. Right. And that's how that's what the spirit led him to do that. So John was pointing out that when Jesus was among us as a man, he expressed what was going on in the mind of God. Mm -hmm. He told us the thoughts of God. You know, he he was God's utterance on earth, unveiling to us what Paul calls the secret and hidden wisdom mm -hmm. of God. And so what God thinks what God thinks is reality. That is what ultimately Yeah, when he comes speaks it, it comes into being. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So he thought about an earth. It came to being. He thought about a universe. Sprang into being. He thought about everything we see around us, even we ourselves, and we came into being. So what exists are the thoughts of God. And that's the truth. That is the very truth. 
that we can stand on. That is the ultimate. That is behind everything. Absolutely. And so Jesus came to unfold to us that right. to us and to show us uh, so that we're not a mistake. That we don't see that it just happened. But it's like, no, God was totally intricately involved with every piece, every part of who you are, everything that's around us, right? Truth is the foundation of all that exists. To have so, a kingdom, you must have truth. Absolutely. So the first one is that it's the supremacy of the king. Mm -hmm. The second is the truth. The truth. That the okay. logos, the actual, that God is absolute truth. Right. And the third is that we're guaranteed that the kingdom of God is eternal. That's right. That That's it always right. was and always will be. Right. It's not reactive. It right. doesn't respond to change. God has already thought it through. He's proactive. He lives outside time, right? That's He's right. never surprised by our actions and our activities. He had a solution to the fall of Adam and Eve before they even decided to rebel, correct? That's right. So the apostle points out that God had all these things planned for, that the Messiah would die and later resurrect from the dead and ultimately rule from heaven. So Peter says this in Acts, one of his first sermons. He said, people of Israel, listen. He says, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you all know. But God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. And then he later on, 32 says, God raised him from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified mm, so to be good. both Lord and Messiah. Yeah, it was already right. prearranged. It was already planned. Okay, right? so the fourth thing is the kingdom of God is expansive. That's right. It means it's still, you know, they, they say the galaxy is still growing. Right. But it's still, it's, stars are still being produced, right? Mm -hmm. Well, God's kingdom is expanding. Mm -hmm. As we establish his reign in our hearts, homes, neighborhoods, and communities, and so on. So over these next few weeks, we're going to be looking at how is the kingdom of God, this unshakable world, how is it an expanding in a shaken world? Right. I love Isaiah 9, 6 through mm -hmm. 7. For a child will be born to us, a child will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government and peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish, so it uphold it with justice, righteousness, from then on and forevermore. And the Lord host will accomplish this. So the kingdom of God is based on a blood covenant made by a king. And That's we right. know that. That is just this an exciting, exciting thing. Yeah. You know, in ancient Near Eastern royals, excuse the uh, ring of some of the In An ancient Near Eastern royal uh, treaties, there was a blood covenant. And it was done to seal the promises that were made. Mm -hmm. And so in, in this part, an animal is killed mm -hmm. and cut down the middle. And then the two halves are laid opposite each other. And then the two parties to the covenant would pass between the two halves of the animal. And, and by doing this, they would basically say, may God do so to me mm -hmm. and more if I break this covenant. In other words, just the way we, we were walking between animals that were cut in two, right? Mm -hmm. And they're part of the blood covenant. Um, may God do so to me if I break this covenant. In other words, may I be right. split apart like, the, like these animals, wow. right? This is a blood covenant that cannot be broken. You know, when you make a blood, there's a lot of covenants that you make. But this one was like, you cannot break this when it's made with blood, right? Nice, nice. Psalms 89 says this. It says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. That's a beautiful song, right? Yeah. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. And then he says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So there was a covenant that was even spoken of in the Old Testament that there was going to be a covenant for us, right? So we always have to remember everything was initiated by God, That's His right. mercy. It's not anything we have done. It wasn't by that we were just living these wonderfully righteous lives that God mm -hmm. chose us. And yet we were sinners God chose us. That's right. And it says in His word that He didn't pick the Israelites because they were godly people. He picked them because they were a sorry bunch. He wanted to have to bring them as His own, right? Right. So it's just important. This covenant is established that's why a messiah that was going to be like a lamb where his blood was going to cover and bring unity to everyone to bring mm -hmm. it back to the lord that's right that's why there has to be 
there's sacrifice of blood. That's right. So, you know, in communion, every time we celebrate a relationship through communion, we're reminded of that blood covenant, right? That was established through the death of, of Christ. You know, First Corinthians, it talks about it. It says, uh, Paul said this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Mm -hmm. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so he was speaking about, you know, the fact that he was going to give of himself and he's going to shed his blood, not only to cover our sin mm -hmm. like the lambs would, but to take mm -hmm. away the sin. That's right. what the apostle, um, right. that's what the John the Baptist said. Right. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. And so, so Paul is saying this. This is a new covenant in his blood. And then he says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of him. Mm -hmm. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So every time you have communion, you're basically, it's, it's a reminder that you are in a blood covenant. It cannot be broken. Mm -hmm. This covenant cannot be broken. You can't do something that's going to break this covenant. God has already given, the Lord has already given his blood. He can't take it back. It's, his, it's already been spilled for you and for me and for us, right? And so, so we proclaim the Lord's death every time we take communion. So it's a special moment for you to be able to spend time with God, you know, and, and be able to just reaffirm in your own heart what he has done for you. Mm -hmm. And so in conclusion, and this is the last part of it, is that the, the eternal kingdom of God will not be shaken by any event that occurs on this earth. And that's because we have a king. Mm -hmm. And that's it. For we have, what's that song? And in his unfailing love, mm -hmm. we will not be shaken. Mm -hmm. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. Blessings. Have a great God night. Bless you.